<laughs> you know, I want to start with saying it's an interesting thing that there's people who call you a heretic because you say you believe all the words in one book. Is that a strange thing? If you've watched any of my videos um, lately, there was one in particular where I pointed out that the doctrine of original autographs only was only created can anybody take a guess who's not watched my videos when the doctrine of original autographs only was created the idea that only the original copies are inspired and everything else is not give me a raise a hand I guess so I can call on you and you can say a date name one 1970. Uh, it's a little before that anybody else 1881, four months before the ERV, the English Revised Version, came out, with advanced copies of the, of the text maybe coming out. I, I've seen some conflict over that. I, I do careful research, but the real release date was in August. In April of 1881, that's when A.A. A. and B.B., A.A. A. Um, a. A. Hodge and B.B. Warfield, got together and rewrote the Westminster Confession to say that only the original autographs were past tense inspired. Before that, it was providential preservation. God in his providence, God provided preservation into your language and believe that the English Bible was God's provided preservation of his words for everything you need as a Christian. That was the statement of faith. It wasn't just the London Baptist of 1649, it was also the Westminster Confession of Faith. It was just said in slightly different words in 1649 and 1650s by the, by the Baptists. But the fact was, it was believed even before that, otherwise they wouldn't have just suddenly decided, hey, I guess we'll just say that for fun. No, they really believed that God providentially provided for preservation of the Holy Scriptures. So the fact that people now do it, it's kind of like people now saying, if you don't think LGBTQRSTUVWXYZ is the greatest thing since sliced bread, plus, then you're a bigot and you're a thisophobe and a thatophobe. Well, that's kind of a shift from the real history. That's only the view of people just before an empire goes. <laughs> so that is the same kind of thing. The doctrine of original autographs only, I take it like um, Wizard of Oz. Yo, O A O. Original autographs only. Yo, O A O. So that's what they're doing. They're just, they're walking by, trudging along, ruining your life by telling you, O A O. You can't possibly have what God wants you to have because. God was really good one time. Can I give you a logical argument? A real logical one? Pretend, and it's really major. Pretend I'm an inspired writer, one of the inspired writers of Scripture. Just put that person instead of me for a moment. God gives the word, and the guy writes down the words. These are the words, and who are they benefiting right now? The guy who writes them, right? So he reads them to people. Who's he benefiting? The guy he's reading to, right? But according to, like I mentioned in the last session, Gleason Archer, who left Fuller in 1960 saying it had become too liberal, said it would take a miracle to ensure the inerrancy of a single copy of an original autograph. So that means that the benefit stopped there. As soon as somebody went down and said, well, let me look at those words. <laughs> Nope, he didn't copy it right. It's impossible. That's what they teach. It's always good when somebody teaches you something to break it down, like Chris, Brother Chris said. Always break it down to its smallest pieces and see if it makes sense. Does it pass the smell test? No, it doesn't. Because that means that God only providentially provided for the guy who wrote it and the first guys who heard it off the original copy that the guy wrote it down on. 
No one else through all history got the benefit of God's actual words. You have to ask yourself, which I did, a simple logical question, then why does God hold me responsible for the words that I've never seen? Second, ready for the second one? If you believe the doctrine of, oh, hey, oh, you cannot have a Bible. You know why? What happened to the original autograph of the Ten Commandments? <laughs> Moses broke them at the foot of the mountain. And then God said, take two tablets and call on me in the morning. <laughs> he had a headache. Bye-bye first. That's it. There's no Bible now. There's no original. Oh, no, wait. God with the finger of God. Even though Moses carved these ones, God with the finger of God wrote it again. Then what did God say? Make an ark. Stick it inside. Ah, there goes the second one. <laughs> Nobody's got access to that unless you got the Ark of the Covenant. How about the third one? Write it on a scroll. That's great. Who gets it? The Levites. Who else? Mm, the king gets to look at it while he's making his copy. you good. Deuteronomy. King is supposed to do that. And so a few kings got to see it. And then, <laughs> nobody else. And what about the copy that the king made? What about the other copies that the Levites made? What about all those? <laughs> no inspiration, no nothing. So how can God hold you responsible throughout all ages if only the original? Now, okay, now remember, Moses' scroll now is big. Animal skins and the big old long stick. you got to carry it over here like this. What about Jeremiah's? Jeremiah's talking. God says, take that, all that stuff you just wrote. Yeah. I want you to wrap it to a stone. I want you to throw it in the water. What? You get the idea? Where, is, where are the original autographs there? But let's take it. Animal skin. What did... did, did uh, you work from animal skin all the way across one to another to another to another to another. Did anybody take all of them and sew them all together and hand them to you? No. Then you can't have an original autographs Bible. Because in order to have any one thing to put all those parts in, first of all, you have to have all the parts together at the same time. And second, as soon as you made a copy, it's no longer inspired. So they've never been gathered together, never were gathered together, never will be gathered together, and can't be gathered together according to the doctrine of oh, way, yo. That's why they're so bummed. That's why they have to go, yo, ho, oh, way, yo. They got nothing. That's why we people, people used to sing in Bible college, my hope is built on nothing less than Ryrie Notes and Moody Press. Schofield Notes and Oxford Press. Because all you're trusting is your teacher. When I studied Greek, the professor was honest. I like Dr. Paul. Disagree with him on Sinaiticus, but that's okay. He knows because somebody sent him my book. Um, but I love him. He's still a brother in the Lord. I don't go playing that game with people and dividing people out of the kingdom of God. That's not, not my job. He's a brother in Christ. But um, he said, the correct pronunciation of original Greek goes back to your professor's professor. Get it? One, nobody pronounces Greek the same. And two, it means you have to rely on your professor who learned from his professor. So your correct pronunciation, because it's from my professor. But I trust the scholars. But that actually, even though it's a joke there, it's too true everywhere else. They trust the scholars because they don't trust God. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm trying to be literal. Please follow with me. If you see any logic errors, tell me now because I'm willing to listen. I was anti-King James in every possible way. I used to go online and Debbie remembers, I'd go on and see how fast I could say all my anti-King James art art arguments while reading articles until that Gail Ripplinger article with James White. And I went, 
and I was reading it through. I didn't know about Gail then. I uh, just G.A. Rippling or whoever that was, some German person. So I'm reading this argument back and forth, and I'm going raw, raw on James White until I get to this one point. And I went, oh, okay, Rippling is right on that one. It was obvious to me. Because I promised God that I would go wherever he led me. And if I couldn't shoot holes in it, I'm going to that argument. No matter what it is, because I care about the truth and I have a God to please. And seriously, I want rewards. Dude, well, aren't there a lot of parables about what happens if you don't? And doesn't Jesus tell you to, what to treasure in heaven? Didn't he tell you to store it up? So like, that's greedy. No, it's not. It's what Jesus told you to do. And if it's greedy, God made it. It's his fault. That's a greed he wants us to have. Be greedy for your wife. That's, then the lust isn't lust in the same way. It's desire. It's the same word, epithumia, but you see it as desire rather than lust because it's your wife. You're supposed to have all those feelings for her. You see what I'm saying? If it's for God, you're supposed to have that devotion to God. Not supposed to have that devotion to the Jesuit general. You're supposed to have that devotion to God. See, there's places where God made what we're supposed to do to fit. You get it? You have all these different characteristics. You go, oh, I'm only human. Yeah, but God made everything for a reason. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. Every, every, there is a place. There's a place for killing. There's a place, God says, look, you don't go beyond, but if a person kills, you kill them. Bam! Execution done. Get the blood guilt away. God said so. Is there forgiveness? Yes, and it's awesome. If an enemy comes against you, you do something special for them. Instead of doing revenge, that's even better, and Jesus showed us that better way. But only by the Holy Ghost can we get beyond ourselves to do that. God has provided a better way. God has provided something he wants us to do with ourselves, and I want to covet the greater things. Jesus said through Paul, by the way, remember, if God's talking to a human, no man's seen God at any time, meaning God the Father, he's revealed himself through the Son. So that means the guy in the Garden of Eden, that wasn't the Father, that was the Son. That was the Son that was in the furnace. That was the sun. That was all these different places and all the different visions. It was the sun on the throne. Sun, 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 sun. Until we get to Revelation and then you go, I'm not really sure because the lamb is, you know that lamb is Jesus, the lamb is the lion, and then you got somebody else on the throne. That's probably the father. Yeah. But that's about it. And that's not, that's the last book. So it, it's not fair because everything gets changed at the last book because that's when we all win. And that's when everything works. Until then, we have our professors telling us, trust us, <laughs> I'm a scholar. So he's, what he's telling you is, if you get what I'm saying and why I'm saying it, I'm not trying to be mean to anybody. An OAO person is saying, I've never seen a Bible. I could never see a Bible. There's never been a Bible because there's never been a compilation of the original autographs ever. They've not even been grouped in one building. 53. Can you remember that number? 52 weeks in a year plus one. 53. 52 in the New Testament, 51, and one in the Old Testament, the times the word scripture appears. Every single time it refers to a copy, or a copy of a copy, or of a copy 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 of a copy. And a few copies on. Okay? That's what I want you to remember. What God calls scripture is not what the scholars call scripture. Scholars call, oh, hey, yo. Why? Because then they can tell you what scripture is. Or, or is close to. And then they always have what we call wiggle room. That's what fits their devices. That's what fits their greed. That's what fits their selfishness. That's what fits their extra credit. That's what fits their extra degrees. That's what fixed their doctoral studies. That's what fixed their paleography. That makes room for them. If they can say it's not quite, then they get to fill in that space. And then who do you trust? If there's no Bible, then 
you have a God who's unrighteously judging you by these words. Which words? The words you don't have. The words nobody has ever had because nobody's ever had a Bible. Nobody's ever had 66 books together compiled that can have the actual words of God. That is what the real doctrine of original autographs only is. By the way, since I've started telling about this on my YouTube channel and stuff, my boss started checking online, and churches are removing the words original autographs out of their statement of faith and just saying, we believe the Bible. Always ask, if you go to a church that says, we believe the Bible, which, which, Because I got some ones, if I read you some stuff out of it, you'd go, I don't believe that. Exactly. The devil doesn't care what book he gets you to. He only cares what book he gets you from. Why am I here? That's the wrong... There it is, sorry. That's Bethel Congregational Church. That's my family's church where I grew up. United Church of Christ, World Council of Churches. Now... It has a rainbow in front of it. And it's LGBTQRSD UVW. Don't want to offend anybody. XYZ plus. That's where it was. When I first came back to Christ in August of 1980, um, I wanted to come back and talk to the minister and tell him I'd gotten saved. I didn't know all the doctrine. I didn't realize that yet. I didn't. All my memory wasn't back. I'd just come out of the occult, so I wasn't really clear that when I was nine years old, there I was with a chick tract, and I read and received Jesus and then went all into every other direction. Didn't realize that God had his hand on my life. I didn't know yet that God never let me go too far. I went into all sorts of different things, even spirit contact and stuff like that, but I never went too far. He always protected me. Unlike anybody else I knew that got into this stuff, I, it just, it always stopped at a point. And everything I learned ended up helping Jack Chick when I worked for him. Helped me write, helped me research, helped me know things that other people couldn't know. Because they weren't there, but I was. I got to have been there, okay? God is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants to, amen. But I wanted to tell the guy I was a Christian, and I was so excited Finally in November, I moved in with my mom that year, 1980, and I went over to Bethel to go to talk to the pastor before he ran off of the secretary. And I, what? And I went to tell him that I had become a Christian. And by the time I finished talking with him, I realized he was not a Christian. Now you think, that's awfully, he, just because he's a little more liberal. Well, later on, my mom and I were talking about where I would go to seminary after I graduated Bible college. He was, and uh, that was Paul Gaston at that time? Yeah. Uh, and uh, Gaston. And we went to him to talk about where to go and, and where would he recommend I go for my, for my Master of Divinity degree. And so we sat down in his office and he said, okay, well, first tell me what you believe. And I gave the gospel. And my mom at the time was agnostic and said, well, I think if you're a good person and you kind of work things out that, you know, things will whatever. That's about how far it went. I mean, honestly. And then Dr. Paul Gaston looked over at my mom and said, I agree with your mom. I believe then whatever system, religious system in which you live, that you live up to its expectations, that when you die, whatever experience there is to have of God, you will have. Period. That was it. Oh, way, oh. It does something when you don't believe the scriptures. It changes you. So I asked, is, is, is this end time church then just a big apostasy or is it an opportunity? I'll get to that at the end, but we'll go on. I want to tell you some stuff I didn't tell you before. Oh, this is not as easy. Wait. Ah, there you go. Let's yellow it up. Let's get some highlights on this. I want you to see this. This is some of the information that Kalanikos Hieromonakos, he was the guy who knew Constantine Simonides. And he wrote some letters. And before Chris, 
Brother Chris can tell you, before I believed Constantine Simonides, when I still believed he was a lying liar who lies from Lyville, <laughs> I checked up on the words of Kalanikos Hieromonakos and his words I could verify. So Kalanikos' words I could historically work out. Even when I hadn't spent the time even to look, I just believed what the scholar said, including Scrivener, about Simonides. But here's what Kalanico said, 1864. He talked about the same codex was cleaned with a solution of herbs on the theory that the skins might be cleaned, but in fact that the writing might be changed as it was to a sort of yellow color. It had also been cleaned with lemon juice professedly for the purpose of washing the vellum, but in reality to the the, weaken the freshness of the letters. And Chris affirms that I'm kind of the first guy who ever noticed this in that way on my own. When Stephen Avery, who's, who he, after Stephen Avery had seen what happened to Chris, that you heard about before, the vilification that happened to Brother Chris, and he thought, I don't agree with him or anything, but it's awfully mean. And so he started just checking out some stuff that Chris was talking about and went, dude, the guy's right. Let's check this out some more. And so he started checking out Codex Sinaiticus, and then he sent me a, a text to become friends on Facebook. I don't even know this guy. His brother's a very famous scholar. He changes his name to hide all that. His brother's a very famous guy. Um, but uh, Stephen then said, I want you to look at this document. And I'm going to show it to you in a little bit. And that's when I told you the story, right? When I looked at it, I sat there for four hours on digital, on uh, codexsinaiticus.org, looking at the Sinaiticus and flipping between its pages and between where it was white looking and where it was colored looking. And he said, do you think somebody lightened up the pages? And I looked at the ink and I said, but the ink is not come up. And if you lighten something, it's like bleach. I mean, it brings the ink up. But if you, but then I looked at it and it was like, seminary past, you know, I was like, going, dude, that's like when I spilled coffee in one of my books. Only like somebody, it spilled and then they wiped it and then they turned the page and they wiped it some more and they turned the page and they wiped it some more and eventually it started evening out somewhat as it went through. It's spreading through these animal skins. And then it looks like it started here because that's where the initial splash marks are. And then over here, it looks like they started only a little smoother that way and went that way. Except for the white pages, if you went to skip the white pages, if they're not there. So it had to happen when the white pages were already removed. And that was, I knew nothing. I said, is it possible that people used to stain pages to make them look older? I had no theory yet. I was completely against the things that Chris had talked about. I, I believe Scrivener. So I didn't have any vested interest. I was just having fun looking at stuff because I'm a wonk. I do that sort of thing. So then at the here, the rest with increase. Oh, we're going to get to this in a minute. I'm going to go on. Now, this is Garthausen, and this is a, a guy here who's referencing some other people. A guy named Harold Idris Bell in 1909, from, in early codices from Egypt, said right here that he believed Codex Sinaiticus was from the early 5th century. That's the 400s. Remember, 400s is too late to really be of big help as far as ascertaining the original autographs. That's, that was the the modern text critical thought. Then another guy, Theodore Burt, said in general, it says, it goes, oh, he had said 6th or 5th century, but then a commentary about it, there is no indication that either of these men had actually seen Sinaiticus. They'd actually not, he'd not even seen it with their eyes. They'd just seen a printed copy and then developed all the theories based on what was printed. Not even photographs, okay? They'd not even seen the manuscript or discussed even the condition of the parchment. How could they? You have to see it to discuss the condition. And again, paleography is the con that you can look at a manuscript and tell how old it is just by looking at it. Okay? Wrong button. There we go. David Trobish gave the keynote address at the recent Codex Sinaitic Conference on July 6, 2009, at his, as his knowledge of the text far surpasses my own, this guy here says, I'll have to defer to his opinions on the subject. His speech in London was entitled Codex Sinaiticus and the Formation of the Christian Bible. His conclusions were that the manuscript isn't nearly as old as the hype suggests. David Trobish. That he, that, that he dates the text to the 5th or even 6th century, that's 500s AD, 
believes that many people with a vested interest in promoting the work gave it the earliest date possible, which is the early 4th century. More. Uh, now we're getting to Forensic Chemistry, 1921, by Alfred Lucas. Discoloration due to age is largely a process of oxidization brought about by natural means, and it takes place in proportion to the extent to which the paper has been exposed to the light, and hence the outsides and edge of the old documents, outsides and the edge of the old documents, outsides and the edge of the old documents, which are the most exposed, become the most discolored, the discoloration progressively diminishing toward the less exposed parts. I'd asked Steve, I said, wait a second, if it's weathering and stuff and aging, wouldn't it mean that the book, if it, had, if it looked so consistent, wouldn't it mean that they had to equally leave every single page open for ages? My books are like that. I, if I have a closed book or a book open to one page, that page is discolored, the edges are discolored, but the rest of it's all nice and clean, right? Do you guys ever have any books like that? I have a lot of books. We don't have wallpaper. We have... <laughs> so I'll leave off on Kalanikos again. I'll get to this in a minute. Now, this is a letter that was really important. This is Ira Rabin. He's uh, that. Bundesanstalt für Materialforschung und Prüfung. I apologize to whoever I just offended. I don't know what I asked. I may have ordered an oven fried tractor or something. I don't know. But Dr. Ira Rabin is a scientist. And there was an interesting thing that they were going to, in April 2015, do, number three, chemical testing of Sinaiticus. We were so excited. Stephen wrote him. He said, sorry, I didn't answer your email. Unfortunately, the study was scheduled for April 2015, was canceled. And that's the reason I never written to you. I'm not sure if we'll be allowed to conduct it. There's a new director in the conservation department who decided he isn't interested. After that, they wrote back and he asked them, so, but why are you asking anyway? And so Stephen told him why he was asking. Questions about how old it is. He said, dear Stephen, thanks a lot, most interesting, but I must assure you, the decision not to study was not dictated by fear of unpleasant discoveries. I was present in the main discussion. The, the, man, the fellow who knows nothing of this manuscript happens to be simply the head of the conservation who was mad that the testing was decided without his knowledge, but with blessing of the conservator of the manuscripts. So even though the conservator of the manuscripts said, yes, you can do the study, the head of it said, yeah, but you didn't ask me. So that's why we're not going to do it. I don't know. That does not ring so true to me. It could be, but eh, maybe. Then he says here, he made a dramatic speech, a dramatic speech, that the name could be damaged, that the name could be damaged by analysis, and he doesn't need to know anything about the materials to preserve it. I don't need to know anything. Today, some of the Leipzig leagues are completely eaten through. Others are not. That was the main reason for the conservator of the manuscript to request the analysis. The damage was to have been incurred in Leipzig, but no one knows when. I didn't want to test the inks. I did want to test the inks. Sorry, I didn't mean to say that. Their composition is more than interesting for my ink studies. Ira. So there you go. Let's take a look at this right now. I want you to see some stuff for yourself. You don't mind, do you? Seeing for yourself? That's what this whole thing's about. Don't trust the scholars. Find it for yourself. If you can't find it, ask me. I'll do my best if I don't already have it, because I probably do. Okay, so Q46. Remember what a choir is? Four long sheets, fold it over, becomes eight folia, front and back. That's a page, front and back. Front is R for recto, right, front. Back is verso, because you turn to it, turning back. And you have 16 pages. It's like half of a signature. And when you're making a book, you usually do 32 pages. It's called a signature. Half of that is a choir. Okay? Half a signature. So this is from choir 46, folio 8, verso. So that's the end of one choir. Because it's always 8, verso is the last one. And then one recto is the next choir. And you go from 46 to, there it is, Q47. So we're between Jeremiah 9, 25, and then Jeremiah 
uh, uh, sorry, 10.25 on the end of that one and starts at Gen uh, Jeremiah 10.25 at the top of that one. That's one of the first things I checked to make sure it was so, but it's all, all verified multiply. They did a great job over there. Now, do they look exactly the same to you? This is where I think it all Did I go out? Okay. This is where I think it all started. I think the spilling, the first spill happened here. Call me crazy, but it just looks like that. This is where I got the idea. This is what started the whole thing. If I was wrong, I sure found out a happenstance of an awful lot of really interesting coincidences, okay? So let's just pretend it's a coincidence. Regardless, you got this wonderful spill, splash, whatever. And on this side, do you notice absence of splash? I'm going to show you something else in a minute. So I want you to get used to seeing this before I switch it to the facsimile that was sent to me by Jack McElroy to Chick Publications from Boston to Rancho Cucamonga, Southern California, okay? So that was what I was sent. You'll see in a second. You'll see it looks exactly the same, of course, because they wouldn't change it and make it all the same color, would they? <laughs> this is the first question I asked. What? I was starting my study on this, and I was, I was expecting the same thing that those scientists did. It's the same, it's the same picture. Until I found there's a, notebook, a little book that comes with it. I have the booklet. He sent it to me. And it said we, we made some sensitive adjustments. Now, let's see how sensitive that looks to you. One, two, one, two. Okay, are right, you getting the idea? Okay, so here's another one. This is Tobit, Q37 F, uh, v, uh, V3V. Uh, we got uh, Tobit 17 to 22, and then it starts at Tobit 22 right there. 22, sounds like a little dress. Okay, so you got Tobit, and then here's what it looks like here. One, two, one, sensitive adjustment, <laughs> sensitive adjustment. I asked myself a simple question. If it doesn't matter, why did they change it? Who asked for it to be changed? Stephen Avery wrote letters to everybody and he said, I don't know, ask him. I don't know, ask her. I don't know, ask them. It's so funny because we went down the list of the people that are responsible for it and nobody claimed responsibility. We still don't know who did it. I did a video called Who Colored Sinaiticus? Now, if you look, if you look here, this is from my big poster that I made. I'll show it to you close up, uh, big, the big poster in a second, and you'll see it almost life-size here. But there, see the, the difference? So you can see right there, that is the Leipzig uh, stamp. Okay, so you, there's Leipzig, and there's not Leipzig, that's British Library. So even my photograph of my poster, you can see it. That's my, my LG camera taking a picture. Let me show you here. Here's another one. That's another one of those boundaries between the parts that he stole in 1844 and the parts that he stole in 1859, or borrowed in 1859. And never returned, by the way. It's still not back at the monastery. A little late. Okay, there you go. There's that one. See it? Even from there you can tell. And I have people said, you doctored the images. I said, no, I didn't. Go to the site yourself. I changed nothing. It's exactly identical. I did no digital alteration whatsoever. This is my poster. This is, you see, my, a couple of my books in the back. Somebody said, one person wanted to know about my library and says, that's a lot of books. I said, that's just the front. There's whole rows behind that. That's just a chick. That's not counting home. So that's the poster of all known pages of Sinaiticus. Can anybody, okay, see if you can tell, and I want you to say it out loud, 1844 or 1859. Ready? Okay. 18, boy, you are so non-enthusiastic. You are this quiet at church. Eight again, 1844. What about this one? 59, 1859. How about this? And this? And that? Oh, my goodness, I tried to trick you and I didn't trick you. How did you know? What a strange coincidence that you were able to figure that out. Somebody said... And I just did this in another video. You can watch that video where I actually, I zoomed way up close 
And they said, well, it's because you use a black backing on the one and you use a tan backing on the other. Well, first of all, I showed the sign in Etika's website where they told you that, no, they didn't. They got it as close to a tan background so they could get this consistent color out of it. So I'll go back just one more time. Does it look like those are completely different backgrounds? The cardboard on which they set the pages, they look completely different to you or pretty close? So not enough to account for that. And where did they get that permanent marker from? I would love to use that for marking some of my clothes. That would be great. All right, so let's come closer. Take a look at it there. I thought you'd like to see this. I mean, who else is going to do this for you? I mean, this is the whole thing. Who else will do this? That's why it's so fun to be a wonk. I will do stuff that other people just will not do. You heard that lawyers were... Um, they were, sorry, they were deciding to use lawyers instead of lab rats. Because they're, you know, they, you get them to do what you want to, and besides, there's some things a mouse just will not do. So, there you go. So, there, <laughs> I will do these hard things. This is that book that Brother Chris has been telling you about. This is uh, Codex Sinaiticus and the Simonides Affair. And that is something of 1982, and it's from the Greek stuff. Um, and it's for the patriarchate, and it was done for them uh, in the Greek Orthodox Church. Published it, and here I'm going to read you some stuff. Now here's what I want you to know about what you're about to see. There's another hint. You're going to see italics, and you're going to see up and down letters. The regular up and down letters are the same in both versions of the translations that were printed in England of what Kalanikos wrote about Tischendorf and the Sinaiticus. Did everybody get what I was saying? So Kalanikos, Hieromonakos, is writing about the Sinaiticus and Tischendorf. Okay? In those, one of the places, the literary churchmen printed more words. Then the other one that's in the Journal of Sacred Literature, the one I've spent all my time reading. So just before I left for here, I read it again. And I went, I feel so dumb. I actually had developed a theory about some stuff, which I can't tell about here, but it's, it's really exciting to me. And it'll come out in future videos and another book. But I found some stuff that's in this italics. And you just get the benefit of seeing it all. So when you see the italics, realize that I have not been reading the italics. I've been reading the other stuff. It's been a long time since I've read this book. Okay? But I want you to see this for yourself. Ready? For I myself saw him, Tischendorf. Oh, sorry. No, Simonides, first of all. Let me, sorry. I've got to get back to Simonides. First, he's talking about that, that this is a genuine work of the indefatigable Simonides. Because he was like, remember that guy I told you about, Bacon? And how he did a million pages in a year. A million, a million words in a year, sorry. Well, Simonides was kind of that kind of a guy. Amazingly good and amazingly fast. Of course, so fast that he made some really stupid mistakes. And it was very funny. It's hilarious. But anyway, for I myself saw him with my own eyes in February 1840, riding in an Athos. In February of 1840. I knew, and that's where he was in Athos, riding it. That's where he's working on, some, uh, on it. And he says, and, oops, there it is. And owing to the death of the head of the monastery, he left the word unfi work unfinished and went to Constantinople, taking the codex with him. I know about the meeting. I know who was there. And it was a coffee house. I know who was visiting. I know the guy who was the next patriarch who came to that meeting. <laughs> I know that when the head patriarch of the, of the Orthodox Church saw the sign of he said, uh, interesting book. Why don't you send it over to me and I'll send it down to St. Catherine's and have my own scholars like, you know, fix it up a little bit and prepare it for you so you can do a new one and we'll get that one out to the czar like you want. So that's the kind of meeting he had because he looked at it and probably went, heresy, heresy, because it had all these horrible words missing and changed in it, right? Okay, so there it is. And you notice all that was in italics? So the other people in Britain didn't read that part. Only the people who read The Literary Churchman. But you can't get a nice big book from the Journal of, of, the, of uh, Sacred Literature with the Literary Churchman words in it. You have the ones with less words in it. There's more. Wait till you see this. And then it talks about, you know, the patriarch sent the codex there to 
Sinai or whatever, through Germanus, in order that the transcript might be compared with other copies of the Old and New Testament, then be transcribed by the same Simonides and sacredly presented to the emperor of Russia, I just told you that, uh, on the part, not of the monastery of St. Pantalemon, according to the original intention of Benedict, nobody got to know about that because it's in italics, it was only the literary churchman who printed that, the other place didn't even print it. But on the part of the patriarch, Constantius, the one I was telling you about, he decided he wanted it redone in the form of the other three that were already at the monastery in the standard Byzantine text, but with Constantine Simonides' beautiful writing to do it the right way. So they give him the corrections, fix it back. The problem for Simonides, though, is he would betray his great uncle if he did so. Because before his great uncle died, he said, swear to me, you're going to finish the, you're going to get this and send it off to the czar. When he, when eventually Simonides gets word of this and abandons the Sinaiticus completely because he doesn't want to be held responsible for breaking his, the, the per, one person who matters in his life, that he'd break his word. So instead he goes and publishes um, Barnabas, uh, goes around the, the whole Aegean Sea over to Smyrna to his friend. Uh, Rodokanakis and gets it printed. And I found all the history of the Rodokanakis family. All this stuff's real. It's amazing. Okay, now, Callistratus, he's the guy down at Sinai, or St. Catherine's, the fake Sinai, uh, at the monastery. He's a guy who recognized for himself how bad it was, and he had an attitude about it. Is Callistratus a wise man and companion of the same house? That was taken out. And that's important, too, because Simonides said it, and they said, oh, there's no Callistratus. They did all this kind of stuff to Simonides in order to discredit him. They took away pieces and then let other people think that Simonides was just a liar. Anyway, undertook the comparison of it and did compare it with other codices of the same house, there were three, by the command of Constantius the Patriarch. And he was the Patriarch over the universal Patriarch, over all the entire Eastern Orthodox Church. Uh, and he, having partly corrected it, left it in the library, awaiting the return of Simonides. They wanted Simonides to come down and do the fixes. You know why they'd have him come down there? Because what he was writing before was heresy. And if you want to get a guy who's writing heresy to write it right, put him in a desert where there's no way out. It takes you 14 days to get there if you survive the journey. And when you get there, you can't leave or eat or anything unless the head of the monastery says so. Get it? It was a great arrangement. It was, it was really cool to learn the history to figure all this stuff out. Because um, I knew nothing of this. Okay, and he having partly corrected, left it in the library, waiting for Simonides. Oh, look at this. The first calligrapher in Greece. Now, we don't have the Greek. We don't know uh, what, whether, which first it is. Is it the first, meaning the primary, like the archon, the, the, the top guy? The top calligrapher? Because that could be one kind of first, or the other kind, proton, the other, the first in numerical order. I don't know which it is. I was so excited when I saw this before I came up here, and I went, I don't know which one it is. So I just took a picture of it and took it up here with me. So look at that. And then he said, he not coming a good time, the work was altogether neglected and remained in the common library of the monastery until Dr. Tischendorf came to the monastery in May 1844, spending some days there, having examined the manuscript carefully and suspecting it to be ancient, suspecting it to be ancient, was removed. So I never saw that in the Journal of Sacred Literature. Tore off a small part of it. Remember I told you how he cut the pages? He cut those, you can watch my video, I can show you what he did. And I show you what the, what the Sinaiticus looked like from the photographs in 1935, um, or 33 or whatever. Uh, privately, and went his way as if nothing had happened. Isn't that cool? And what's cool is it validates my theory, so I love that. Okay, and then it says, leaving the rest of it in its position, which it had before. That means he didn't rescue it from a wastebasket. The whole story's a lie. Kalanikos is telling you this. Left it where it was before, meaning it was a book. Then he closed the thing back up, And he went off and whistled his way home. He perpetrated this great wrong without scruple. That's also removed. I think that's kind of important, don't you? Oh, they didn't care about it. Oh, yeah, they cared. Okay, let me jump. There's so much down here. I don't want to go into all that. 
All these things then I know being on the spot and declare then openly for dear truth's sake and I further assert that the codex which perfaz nefaz by right and wrong, in other words, by good and bad, it is not good. Dr. Tischendorf abstracted is the same which Simonides wrote 22 years ago, 1840. For I saw it in the hands of Tischendorf, recognized the work. I first mentioned it to Simonides, who had no knowledge of the fact before. Evidently, he knew not the abstraction, stealing out, of his work from the monastery in Mount Sinai. Now, abstraction of the work means the whole book. So that means 1859 he's talking about. Because I've been try I, I have a video, Who Colored Cyanidicus? And I had talked about three possibilities. Well, but either Cy did Tischendorf not know that it was colored? Then he's stupid because he had these white pages for a long time, went to the King of Saxony. When he goes back down and suddenly they're darker, he'd go, who colored it? But he never did. That leaves you with two other options. He knows who did it and allowed it, or he did it himself. Do you know any other logical? I took this apart one step at a time. That's what I came up with. Okay, so let's go on. He said, for I saw it in the hands of Tischendorf, recognized the work. It says, evidently, he knew not the abstraction of his work from the monastery in Mount Sinai. I read also at first this acrostic in it, Simonides' entire work, but after two days, the leaf containing this formal acrostic had been removed. There's only one person then that could have removed that acrostic, and that was Tischendorf. So he knew what he was doing. Why would he do that? Ask Brother Chris about that. He had a meeting with the Pope before he did the beeline for, for Sinai. The meeting with the Pope was where he was trying to get to see Vaticanus. And both of us think together. We have a theory. And the theory is that the Pope said to him with, Card with Jesuit Cardinal Mai, look, you're a nice guy. I got a deal for you. What a, he did in, a, in, in, in French because he tried to speak Latin because um, <laughs> Tischendorf tried to speak Latin, and he has a totally different rationalization. It's hilarious. He said, but, uh, but uh, obviously they knew he couldn't speak Latin well, so he resorted, the Pope resorted, I think, to French <laughs> so they could have a conversation. It was the same thing when he went to speak Greek with the patriarch in, in uh, Cairo. Tischendorf was all proud of his Greek, and the later, the, the, the patriarch writes, this guy's ignorant. <laughs> Don't let him near the manuscripts. And so he wouldn't give him permission. And so Kitchen Tischendorf lied and said he lost his permission slip from the patriarch when he went down to Sinai himself. That's another story. There's so many fun things to tell you about Tischendorf. I can't even start it to tell his story yet online. So I'll get to that. You just heard something I'm going to tell in the future. Okay. But he said, evidently he knew not the abstraction of his work from the monastery. I know still further the same codex was cleaned with a solution of herbs on the theory that the skins might be cleaned. And then italics again. This was not in the Society of Little Biblical Literature or it was in instead in the literary churchman. But in fact that the writing might be changed as it was to a sort of yellow color. What color would you say the parts that weren't white were? Kind of yellow. When in 1859 he abstracted, as they said, the rest of the codex, he described it, Tischendorf himself, with the Latin word suflava, which means yellowed. See, Kalanikos was right. And, but the thing is, is that also proves that Simonides was right. Because he's validating Simonides. And everything I found that he said, I didn't know about this when I was asking Stephen Avery about all this stuff. All I was doing was looking at the stuff online. All right, so then he ends it. Kalanikos Hieromonk, Alexandria, October 16th to 28th, 1862. That's because there's the 13 day difference between the Julian and the, and the Gregorian calendars. Anyway, all right. If you pour 99% water, pure water, and add 1% arsenic, you will make you 100% dead. Do you want to drink this water? But it's only 1% different. 100% dead. A little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Not too long ago, pastors and teachers spoke God's words with complete conviction. Thus saith 
the Lord. Right? People used to believe their King James and critique their teacher. All that's changed now thanks to higher criticism and lower criticism of the Bible. Now people think backwards. They criticize the King James and they believe their teacher. Thus saith my teacher. I won't even tell you the people that people in my area quote. Well, according to... <laughs> well, according to... <laughs> Yeah, I know what you're saying sounds reasonable, but my pastor says, who gives a rip what your pastor says? What's true? Right? And if he's a good pastor, he'll switch to the truth. Congregations trust their preacher, college students trust their favorite professor, but even the Apostle Paul didn't demand that people believe him. They searched the scriptures whether these things... Whoops. These things were so, and that's, I got it out of wrong order. Okay, you got to see this anyway. This is from the original Wino Revival. I modified it for the book. Jack Leck let me do that. We've heard what the Message Bible, NIV, NASV, ESV, New Living, and NRSV had to say, but now listen to what Christianity Today says. <laughs> Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. How can you keep it when you don't know what it is? Is. Do you know why people don't pass out tracts? Because they don't know what they're converting people to. How can you have that conviction? How many, how many, if your pastor isn't here, you can raise your hand for this one. How many of you, or just pretend it was from a previous church. Oh, that was another church. How many of you have ever not wanted to invite a sinner to come to your church because you're scared of what would happen if they did? You're a little bit, I don't know what they're going to do this week. <laughs> People who pass out tracts usually believe in what they're doing. People who don't pass out tracts often don't believe what they're doing. So they can't hand out a tract. What they usually do is tell me, well, you're page 23. Just wrong, brother. This is, I didn't tell you to do anything with it. But do you want them saved or not? I don't know. I see so many people. I got saved with it. If it was all messed up, you should have seen it when I had it. It actually said Lord and Savior. <gasps> Some tracks said make Him your Lord and Savior. No, you can't make God in anything. But people become these... They, they're, they're, they're not literalists about the Bible, but they're hyper-literalists about a tract. Go figure! <laughs> your words, brother, they're just not good. You can't please everyone. But you know, God, the whole point is for God to draw people to himself. And we draw them to the scriptures. That's why we put scriptures in there. And if you don't like it, just show them the other stuff. But talk to them then. Oh, that's too hard. <sighs> people used to be held by the sword. Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes, he's my Lord and he's my Savior. Yeah. Other people tortured for years under communism. Now, I hear you're religious. <laughs> Well, that's only my wife. I, mean, <laughs> I just go to church to keep her off my back. Or I would go, but they're all hypocrites there. <laughs> and what does that make you? <laughs> okay, so you get the idea. All right, Daniel 3.25. I told you about Jesus appearing all the way through the scriptures, right? So here we have, this is a difference a simple difference that is in translations. In the Spanish translation, this is one of the most important verses to a lot of the Spanish speakers. It has amazed us at Chick as we supported the Rina Baleta Gomez. It says here, He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like, say it with me, the Son of God. Now, I'm telling you, when I encountered the Lord in my life, I knew it was the Lord. You didn't have to tell me. Do you think he didn't know who it was? Because God strips away the entire universe when you're in presence of God. Heaven and earth flee away. Sky roll up like a scroll. When it's the Lord, it's the Lord. It's not your theory anymore. Everything strips bare. Do you think he didn't know who it was? Really? Because here... NIV, he said, look, I see four men walking around the fire, unbound and unharmed. The fourth is like a son of the gods. It's four! Ta -da! <laughs> yeah. 
What a difference a word makes. I say, if that's your doctrine, you're going to be very Thor on Judgment Day. <laughs> there it is. Check for yourselves. Look at that. Paul's right. But I want to be encouraging here. Some see the glass as half full. Some see the glass as half empty. I see the need to fill the glass. Are you with me? I don't see the glass as half full. I don't see the glass as half empty. I see it needs more water. I don't see us as half apostatized. I don't see us as fully apostatized. I don't see us as half having a revival. I see us we need one. We need more God. We need more Bible. We need more reading. We need more praying. We need to be serious about what God is serious about and why He didn't take us to heaven when we got saved. Because it's people who need to get saved. That's what I see. There's a need to fill the glass. We need to get filled with the Holy Ghost. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And anybody can have their own opinion if they want to, but I don't really care what anybody thinks. This is the Word of God. I don't care. I had to say this at John MacArthur's University. Oh, I said his name. John MacArthur's University, the Bible Science Association meets at a church building that they, they rent out the building and they can do the Bible Science Association, creationists. And I was allowed to speak. They actually let me speak. And so I spoke. It's online. You can see it for yourself. And I said, I don't care what you think. I'm here to explain to you what I believe and why. So regardless of where any of you all are, this is what I believe. I don't believe in a New King James, American King James, Modified King James, Upside Down King James, Backwards King James, Purple and Blue King James. I care about the King James Bible without anything added, anything we can take away. I believe it is God's words without anything added or anything taken away. I believe it's absolutely true in every part and in the whole. I believe, and I've seen it through, through uh, Jack McElroy's book on the Bible. Wow. What would, um, which Bible would Jesus use? He proved that even with the worst of the printing errors that happened and the, and the things that happened and the, and the arguments that people raised, even the worst mistakes made never changed the doctrine. In fact, even the, the error itself was technically correct. Whether it was he or she, well, is it he from referring to this person or she to this person? Ye, was it this or was it he? It all works. It, somehow it still works. I believe personally that the devil has petitioned over and over to try and destroy this book and does not get permission. For some reason, nobody is able to. Don't forget, this is the same God that said, Israelites, when you empty your farms, empty your homes of all the males who could possibly go to war, and you all go to Jerusalem for the three feasts, the enemy won't even want to come over onto your property. That's in the scriptures, right? They won't even desire your land. That's the God we serve. And for some reason, he's decided not to let people mess up this book. They have to change its name to do it. That's why I won't go with anything different, anything more or less. And that's why I don't care if you call it a Pure, you call it a Cambridge, you call it an Oxford. I use them all. And just to prove it, I preached from a 1611. That was fun. Because I can read it, that's good. <laughs> but my point is, this is something we can have our faith in. That's idolatry. No, it's not. It's listening to what God told you to do. My words abide in you. You can ask what you will. Well, I want his words to abide in me. How can I have them abide in me if I don't know what they are? And if I do know what they are, how can I have them abide in me if I don't get them into me? So that's our thing right now. And if I want to pray for you right now, a thing I can pray, because this is my last little session here. I want to pray that the Lord will touch every single one of you to care about this book and to get it in you. Okay? Father, in Jesus' name, please bless everybody here. Please let the Word of God get into them. Let it be that the Word of God, your holy words, in, we're speaking English, this language, English, will get into their hearts and their souls and their minds and their bodies and transform them like nothing else ever could. Help them to see things as they read the Scriptures that they've never noticed before.
Help them to notice how the literal, careful reading of the scriptures answers almost every question that they have. And the few that are left may even be answered in this life because you're amazing. I pray that you bless every person here with that blessing and everybody a person in the, within the sound of my voice, that you'll bless them with this blessing, that if they simply will, are willing to trust you, that you will go, as you always do, that extra massive mile to get us to where you want us to be. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. Wasn't that great? Amen. We can believe God's word. Praise the Lord. And that's so encouraging. And I'd like to take a minute and pray for Brother David Daniels and for Chick Publications. Can we do that? Sure. Yeah, let's do that. And um, we'll, we'll last but for a break there. And then we got a uh, round table later, so we still got some more good stuff that we can encourage ourselves with. Uh, and David will be there for that. So let's pray. We thank thee, Father, for thy grace, for thy blessings, for thy loving kindness, for the privilege you've had to hear and be encouraged. Uh, where Brother David Daniels, we just pray you'd be with him, Lord God, and go before him and be with him with the Chick Publications, Father, that thy grace and guidance and blessings be there as they travel back. They have their traveling mercies. We're, for, we're glad we can be here for a few days and fellowship together. We just give thanks and praise for the privilege we have to encourage ourselves and to be encouraged. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord.